Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is my grand round on uh, Loving Sleepy. Um, so the title is Let Me Sleep, I'm Tired, which I talked to my own mother every day, but uh, let's hear it on there. So disclosures, nothing. Um, so in this objectives for this study, to so understand the prevalence and significance of insomnia in CPD patients, explore the clinical consequences of insomnia, explore the contributing factors of insomnia in CKD, and discuss management strategies for insomnia in CKD. So usually whenever I see my patients, they usually are like, hey, I'm very tired. Nobody let me sleep overnight, or can you do analysis later? And I have difficulty falling asleep, or sometimes the patient's wife says like, he snores, and he doesn't let me sleep. I'll for that tonight. So insomnia classification. The International Classification of Sleep Disorder, um, ISCD T3 identifies sleep, sorry. Yes. The ICSD3TR identifies three types of insomnia. Um, the ICSD, the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, and the three comes from the third revision. There's short term insomnia disorder, chronic insomnia disorder, and the other insomnia disorder. Chronic insomnia disorder is with those patients. They should have symptoms with at least three times a week over a duration of three or more months. And the diagnosis is not due to any other comorbid disorder. So these are the diagnostic criteria. Um, the patient should have either difficulty initiating, difficulty maintaining sleep, uh, feeling awakening earlier than desired, resisting Persistence of going to bed on an appropriate schedule, difficulty sleeping without a parent or a caregiver, or presence or intervention, or the patient reports or the patient's parent or caregiver observes that he's having difficulty and um, fatigue or malaise, impaired attention, concentration, social, family, occupational, or academic performance, mood disturbance, irritability, subjective daytime sleepiness, behavioral. Um, going for errors or accidents. So A to F should be mentioning that one of each? Yes. Now to talk about the uh, short-term insomnia disorder. So the diagnostic criteria for short-term insomnia disorder is the same as chronic. However, the symptoms should be present for at least less than three weeks. And usually for the, uh, the stressor, uh, usually the insomnia is related to a stressor. And once the stressor is taken care of, then the insomnia usually results. And for all diagnoses of other insomnia disorder, this is met when the patient has insomnia symptoms, but does not meet all the criteria for the other two. So, one fact. Um, thank you. Please for that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you, I may add, for dog, it is 20 hours a day. This film, 16 hours, are split into two-hour blocks. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Long time ago, I know. That's the that's the point you're trying to make. No, it's like being on call, except for it doesn't sleep. Right? Yeah. It's a little tricky. So, sleep just statistics and facts. The recommended sleep for adults over uh, older than 18 years old is at least seven hours per night. Unfortunately, 35.5% of Americans reported sleeping fewer than, hours than seven hours in a 24 hour period, according to the United Health Foundation. Looking at data from 
the United Health Foundation in the graph, you can see that the X axis, the data is since 2014, and the Y axis shows a percentage of adults with insufficient sleep by age. You see that the in the light blue, we see ages between 18 to 44, and in the darker blue, uh, between 45 to 64. We see that adults from ages 16, 18 to 64 report less sleep than older adults by 10%. And since we also serve VA patients um, versus patients who are not in the military, they see that the patients who serve in the military reported insufficient, more insufficient sleep as well. Patients is reported or is it measured? Uh, reported. Um, if you have patients with chronic opiates, let's say they don't sleep, you know, and you see that like what? And they sleep, you know, 20 hours a day in the same sort of minutes. So since we can see how important insomnia is to the population, I uh, thought it's interesting that this study aimed to examine the national trends uh, in outpatient setting for sleep related difficulties and the prescriptions for sleep medications. This data was obtained from the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey from 1999 to 2010. Uh, the data shows people ages from 20 years older. You can see the number of office visits for insomnia. And from 1999 to 2010, the next year we have the years and the Y, we have number of visits in the millions. We also see that in from 1999, the number of visits were about 4.9 million. And this number fluctuated, but by 2010, it was more than five. I'm sure it was going on at 2005. Remember that year. Although the presentation of insomnia, I also seen the number of visits for all visits with patients who were diagnosed with sleep apnea. And we can see that from 1999, the number of uh, reported visits were was close to 1.1 billion. And by 2009, it is close to 8.4 million visits. So could this be just because we were diagnosing that you know sleep apnea and the aspect of uh, uh, sleep fellows and also the five maps and sleep maps, and also that the fact that uh, most of our population is getting more really abuse over time as well. And the trend of the prescriptions, the number of benzo prescriptions ranged from 2.2 million in 1999 to 3.9 million in 2009. However, the number of non benzos uh, increased significantly from 3.1 million in 1999 to 19.7 million in 2009. This similar trend has been seen in benzo receptor agonists and any other sleep medications, including melatonin, uh, remelotion, and dosphere. So it was almost half the life sleeping, just function. This table is from a study that aims to show the impact of chronic insomnia and the quality of life using um, SP36, which is short form survey of 36 items in three match groups. Uh, 240 with severe insomnia, that's SI over there, uh, 422 in mild insomnia, MI, and 391 with good sleepers select from the general population, GS. So, 
severe insomniacs were characterized as having at least two sleep complaints, uh, which includes the difficulties of initiating or maintaining sleep and experiencing non-refreshing sleep and or early awakenings at least three times in a week or at least one month along with a com complaint of impaired daytime function. Whereas mild insomnia were defined as people who had occasional sleep difficulties that were statistically significant when they were compared with good sleepers, but who did not meet the criteria to be characterized as severely insomnia. The three groups were statistically similar for uh, for age, uh, sex, occupation, location, marital status, and socioeconomic status. Looking at the table, we see that there's different components and we see that patients with severe insomnia had worse mean scores in the eight subscales compared to mild insomnia and good sleepers. But there's no significant difference between the sorry, severe insomniacs or mild insomniacs or the severe insomniacs and good sleepers in the dimension of reported health transition. Not able to understand what that is. Sorry. So the data here is from a meta analysis, meta uh, meta analysis of the core studies that try to see if that insomnia independently increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, Seventeen core studies were included, with a total of three hundred and eleven thousand patients or participants. And in the left figure, leftmost figure. On the screen, you'll see a force plot analysis looking at the association between insomnia and the risk of MI. And the seven studies pool, you can see that the insomnia is associated with a significantly increased risk of MI with a relative risk of 1.41. The figure in the middle shows the results from random effects models combining the relative risks of. In, uh, CHD and stroke. Uh, the overall combined relative risk is in relation to insomnia were 1.28 for CHD and 1.55 for stroke. Finally, uh, for the 13 studies that evaluated the association between insomnia and the risk of cardiovascular disease, death, mortality, and insomnia significantly increase the risk of cardiovascular disease mortality by 33%. This data was adjusted for established cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, the thought is that the metabolic and endocrine changes and activation of sympathetic system and elevated levels of inflammatory cytokines um, poor quality of sleep may contribute to cardiovascular deaths. So we know that uh, type 2 diabetes is a significant public health burden, and insomnia is emerging as a possible modifiable risk factor in the development of type 2 diabetes. Since a good population of our CKD patients have diabetes, uh, we wanted to see if there's any association between insomnia and development of uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, the table is from a retrospective cohort study that examined the risk of developing type 2 diabetes among patients with prediabetes and uh, without insomnia. The cohort consisted of 81,233 patients, and out of those, about 30% of were found to have insomnia at some point. The average follow-up was, follow was 4.3 years. Compared to participants without insomnia, those with insomnia were older and were more likely to have uh, look to be above normal weight, uh, more female, uh, white, uh, current or previous smokers, have a history of CHF, hypertension, elevated 
that are dark function tests and low HDM. A total of 14,600 participants had developed type 2 diabetes over an average of 4.3 years of the follow-up. Of the population that had insomnia, about 19% developed type 2 diabetes when compared to 17.6% of those without insomnia. In a multiple multivariable model adjusting for type 2 risk factors, uh, such as age, BMI, sex, race, ethnicity, history of CHF or myocardial infarction, uh, triglycerides, and smoking, those with insomnia were 28% more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than those with without. Therefore, that patients with insomnia had about a 30% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes after adjusting for transitional risk factors. It is thought that this occurred to the disruption, disruption of short duration of sleep could impair the production of leptin, ghrelin, adenopeptin, leading to increased appetite, craving for calorie-dense, high-carbohydrate carbohydrate food, and ultimately insulin resistance. Um, also, that increased inflammation and sympathetic activation could also contribute to increased diabetes risk. Insomnia is also shown to accelerate, accelerate the loss of beta cell function and increase beta cell apoptosis with increased loss of beta cell mass in lab models. Finally, the fatigue associated with sleep loss may also contribute to the decreased amount and intensity of physical activity which may contribute to the development of type 2 diabetes. So this table shows uh, from a systemic, system, uh, systemic review and meta-analysis that is aimed to see the prevalence of insomnia and poor sleep among patients with CKD. Their hypothesis was that the prevalence of insomnia would be higher in patients with CKD than those without CKD was not surprising. Uh, they included data from 93 articles, which included a, around 33,000 participants from 35 studies, which evaluated the presence of prevalence of insomnia. Most of the studies that were having the participants were on hemodialysis. Most of the studies showed that the participants were on hemodialysis. The overall full prevalence of insomnia among patients with CKD was 45% with a high degree of heterogeneity. The full prevalence of insomnia was 19% in the control group, 26% in kidney transplantation, 48% in CKD without uh, kidney replacement therapy, and 46% in patients on hemodialysis and 61% in patients in TB. The, the subgroup and analysis and meta regression for insomnia, the control groups have the lowest prevalences, 0 0.18, uh, than the other groups. In this table, we can see that the group of kidney transplantations used as a reference has significantly lower prevalence of insomnia compared to the peritoneal analysis. The review shows how patients with CKD, the insomnia is more prevalent in more prevalent. Patients with CKD insomnia is more prevalent than in general population. And patients with transplantation have a tendency to have reduced prevalence of insomnia compared to patients receiving hemodialysis or peritoneal analysis. However, because of the significant variability and the finding should be interpreted with option. They show almost the whole thing. Like, we don't need a full lot.
Uh, this study was recently published um, where the authors wanted to investigate the association between cardio and cerebrovascular outcomes and insomnia in patients who initiated maintenance dialysis. Their primary outcome was major adverse cardiac and cardiovascular events, uh, including all cause mortality, stroke, non fatal MI, acute coronary syndrome, and requiring hospital admissions. The total participants were close to 80,000 participants, and compared to no insomnia group, the risk of major adverse cardiac and cardiovascular events, or MACE, was high in, for the insomnia group. Their conclusion with that is that in seven, severe insomnia is associated with increased risk of MACE and all-cause mortality in patients receive, receiving maintenance and dialysis. So in the figure above, you can see that the outcomes are based on the type of insomnia um, versus no insomnia. And you can see that the MACE and all-cause mortality were higher in the insomnia group versus no insomnia. And also being higher in the persistent insomnia group as well. The figure below, we see that them evaluating the risk based on dialysis modality. Although the prevalence of insomnia was higher in PD patients, insomnia related its significance, retained its significance as a risk factor for major MACE and other all-cause mortality, irrespective of dialysis modality. So contributors of insomnia include presence of restless leg syndrome, pediatric, periodic, limb movement, um, sleep apnea, uremia, anemia, bone pain, puritis, anxiety, depression, and laughing during dialysis. So orexin is a neuropeptide that regulates feeding behavior and promotes wakefulness. Uh, the study in the, the left figure shows where authors wanted to assess the relationship between orexin levels and hemodialysis. They found that the patients on hemodialysis have a statistically significant higher levels of orexin. Um, second figure on top uh, is from a study that examined the plasma orexin A levels in patients with insomnia disorders versus normal sleepers. The figure shows that patients with insomnia have significantly higher orexin levels about 62.4 than compared to normal sleepers of 54.8. So does it have any timing? Is it um, what time off do you need to sleep for? I'm presuming overnight, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. And the dialysis patients have more than the control group? Yes, sir. Why did they come up with IT in the focus group? What do you tell about the uh, little like, clouds here? No, <laughs> you might have fun solving the patients. Very good, thank you. How is the rest of the clear and from the home? I'm a, you know, I'm a student. How much of that is the key to It's in there, it's hard to do that. So we don't have to do it. So it's not really good. So we don't have to do it. One of the good mechanics. I wasn't in fact the chicken. So in the, the schematic representation of uh, the integrated uh, physiological roles of Rexin, uh, the Rexin neurons not only regulate the feeding behavior, but they can also promote faithfulness, arousal of fear, related response, and vigilance. Orexin is also maintains wakefulness by inhibiting neurons that promote sleep. A deficiency in orexin can also lead to narcolepsy.
Um, and this figure shows that the melatonin concentration and standard deviations at different points in patients with different renal function. Patients with the worst renal function with GFR of less than 30 that had the lowest mean melatonin concentrations and the best, the patients with the best uh, renal phosphine greater than 80 GFR uh, had the highest melatonin concentrations. Also, the study found decreased melatonin amplitude with advanced renal uh, dysfunction and the melatonin amplitude is measured by the strength of its melatonic rhythm. The things that could explain the disturbance of the circadian melatonin rhythm include daytime dialysis, sleepiness leading to an absence of the trigger to start melatonin production, uh, decreased beta adenine receptor mediated responsiveness, which can lead to a decreased melatonin levels. Uh, some studies also suggested that the timing of the dialysis shifts all the severity of insomnia, such that insomnia is worse among patients who are dialyzed in the morning. Your fellow said the pretty group has higher baseline, higher the deadline is higher from 10 a.m. until 10 p.m. I don't have any estimates. It's probably not making somebody up. Probably the line. I think every two hours you're taking work. How are you thinking? How are you saying? I think it's a little bit of the cash. I want to take a sample. You just have a thin line. Like a line. Just line in and just let them sleep and get the blood out. Like a butterfly. I see. So this table comes from a study in which the authors wanted to investigate the association of systemic inflammation with sleep quality in the in patients on maintenance human dialysis. So sleep quality that during this was measured using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, or also known as PSQI. Um, if it's greater than five, it's considered a bad sleeper. They compared demographics and laboratory data between good sleepers and bad sleepers. Out of all the patients, 79% were bad sleepers. Uh, median score for bad sleepers was about 10. And compared to good sleepers, bad sleepers had a significant lower serum phosphorus and higher serum uh, mutated peptide level. In assessing variable correlations with global Pittsburgh quality sleep quality index scores, lower hemoglobin, higher TGs, um, triglycerides, uh, lower FOS and higher CRP and interleukin 1B are significantly associated with higher global PSQI score. There was a tendency for serum levels of interleukin 6, TMF alpha, and ferritin to be positively correlated, but it did not reach the significant statistical significance. The serum albumin level negatively correlated with the global PSQI score. Um, this study, the study proposes that the higher systemic inflammation is associated with uh, poor sleep quality in human dialysis patients. Do you have it for the off days? Because I think the off days is even lower. <laughs> but the <laughs> hard is different, right? And they have business. <laughs> Total, like, do they account for like continuously or? Sure. Mm -hmm. Even that's in the patients, we just go with this. And then you get that sample for it. 
the treatment approach. Um, insomnia is a common issue among patients with ESKD. Uh, various factors contribute to the condition, including uh, physical discomfort, anxiety, uh, medications, and also the dialysis schedule. The impact of insomnia is significant, leading to the poor sleep quality and reduced quality of life for these patients. Understanding the causes and effects of them and is the first step forward in trying to treat um, this for our patients. So the strategies include both non-pharmacologic as well as pharmacological approaches with a strong emphasis on individualizing the treatment plans to meet each patient's specific needs. Early identification and management of the sleep disorders um, are crucial in improving the quality of life and reducing potential complications of end-stage kidney disease patients. So cognitive behavioral therapy, um, one of the non pharmacological approaches are preferred are, is usually the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI. Um, it has shown there's an effectiveness in a pilot trial involving peritoneal dialysis patients. However, that is a very small group of only 24. And whenever they have increased the sample size, they've noticed that there's no statistical significance when um, they increase the power of, that, power of that study. So this therapy of CBTI includes uh, sleep hygiene, which uh, tells them to develop habits that promote sleep better, such as regular sleep schedule, uh, making sure you don't have one sleep environment, and controls the stimulus, um, not using watching TV or, or using your phone, iPads, or laptops in bed, um, sleep restriction, limits the time spent in bed to so actual sleep time. Um, that means that if you fall asleep or if you're feeling sleepy, go to bed. If you're not feeling sleepy, um, get up and not, don't stay in, on the bed if you're not feeling sleepy. Uh, cognitive therapy addresses the negative thoughts about sleep as well, reducing the anxiety and also trying to improve the quality of it. Relaxation techniques such as deep breathing exercises and progressive muscle relaxation help reduce pre-sleep arousal. These methods help patients develop uh, healthier sleep patterns without relying on medication. But we all know that's not what they want. Um, So pharmacological treatments for insomnia. Sometimes there's a patient's first resort, uh, but we would like to be at the last for treating insomnia with uh, end-stage kidney patients. However, these medications uh, carry significant risks such as fall-related fractures and increased mortality. Uh, common hypnotics include benzodiazepines, zolpidem, and escoplicone. If medications are prescribed, it's crucial to monitor this regularly for side effects and to minimize potential adverse effects. Additionally, it's important to ensure that these medications are appropriate for the kidney for the patient's kidney function and to adjust, adjust dosage as necessary to prevent toxicity.